if you knew you had less than uh, 24 hours uh, to spend with someone, it would be the very last time you would, would ever see them uh, again. Um, who would you want to spend that last 24 hours with and what would you uh, want to talk with them about? Uh, that's a significant question and it's uh, precisely what we're going to be looking at in, uh, in today's text because Jesus now, as we followed uh, his story through the Gospels, um, is um, about to be d betrayed uh, and he decides that he's going to spend his last 24 uh, hours a significant portion of that, having a meal with his disciples, praying with them and for them, and leaving them with some uh, really important teaching. The second half of the Gospel of John is basically made up of, of two parts. Chapter 13 through 17 uh, records Jesus' last hours with his disciples in the upper room. Chapters 18 through 20 record the passion story uh, and then the resurrection account afterwards. While Jesus has performed seven amazing miracles, John refers to these as signs uh, that are meant to establish that he really is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing him we could have life in his name. Even though Jesus has performed these seven uh, amazing signs, beginning with the first sign in Cana of Galilee at a, a wedding reception where he turns water into to wine and then sort of uh, reaching the climax with the raising of his friend Lazarus from the dead. Um, Despite this, Jesus is rejected by the religious establishment who's decided that he needs to be put to death. Understanding the future that awaits him, Jesus in turn turns his attention to his closest companions. His, uh, in a sense, public teaching, um, it, public ministry has drawn to a close, and now his ministry is going to be a private ministry to those closest to him. Jesus introduces this section, or John rather introduces this section of his gospel with these words, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And what Jesus does next, what he says, and how he prays has special significance because it functions in the gospel of John as Jesus' last will and testament. Here Jesus shares some of his most memorable and some of his most important teachings while giving us a breathtaking glimpse into the heart of God the Father. Now, this morning I want to look at four key features of this particular uh, passage, uh, four features that we find only in the Gospel of John. First is this, John is the only one of the Gospel writers who tells us about Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Luke says that there is sort of a backstory uh, that is going on that helps us to understand uh, and put into perspective and into context what Jesus is uh, communicating as he washes his disciples' feet. Luke tells us that the disciples, as they're sitting around uh, the table together, have been arguing with one another about which one of them is the greatest. It's in this context that Jesus rises from the table lays aside his outer garments, ties a towel around his waist, and washes his disciples' feet. This would have been an unexpected, unprecedented act of abject servitude that would have stunned and shocked his followers. And in fact, it explains why Peter tries to argue Jesus out of it. Uh, just a little bit of background. I mean, you know, when we think about roads and sidewalks and all, they're paved, they're great, you know, we wear shoes and socks and all of the rest. Palestinian roads were dirty, they were unsurfaced. Um, people uh, traveled these roads with animals, uh, um, and you can draw the conclusions for what the roads would have been like um, given that. Um, as, as we know, people wore sandals. Their feet would have gotten absolutely uh, filthy. Um, they also, uh, you know, of course, um, uh, became very toughened. Sometimes they uh, were scratched, they bled, they got infected, all the rest. 
and the roads were so bad and, uh, and what happened to people's feet in this context were so bad uh, that slaves were actually exempt from washing a house guest's feet. Someone came to visit you, uh, what would happen is people would wash their own feet with water that would be supplied by their host. In washing his followers' feet, Jesus is taking a role that's actually uh, two rungs lower than that of a Jewish slave. Now, some of us have been involved in, uh, in retreats or, uh, or events uh, where foot washing is, is featured as you know, just kind of a sign of, of God's love for us and so on. The fact um, that Christians today uh, sometimes actually look forward to foot washing really shows us how far we are, how far we have come from the biblical first century Palestinian experience that's actually described in the Gospel of John. Foot washing, to put it simply, was a nasty, malodorous, unhygienic, completely distasteful business that absolutely no one would have done and no one would have looked forward to doing. They would have not done it unless uh, under duress. Not until Jesus. Not until Jesus. Um, other rabbis had taught about humility before. Humility is one of the virtues. But when the other rabbis talked about humility, they always sort of set uh, parameters around it. They put limits on it. The highly respected Jewish rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who died uh, in 218 AD, he was a man who was believed to embody all of the virtues of the righteous. And it was said of him that he was, quote, so humble, he was so humble that he would do anything for others except relinquish his superior position. Jesus relinquished his superior position. And in this, Jesus shows us how to serve. This is one of the gifts he leaves us in the upper room. Jesus shows us how to serve. I have set you an example, he says in John 13, 15, that you should do as I have done for you. And we find much the, the same teaching in uh, the writings of the Apostle Paul in uh, the second chapter of his letter to the, the Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Um, John, or Paul, rather, is actually um, borrowing an earlier Christian hymn, and he quotes it, he inserts it into uh, his letter to the Philippians um, because it, it just so powerfully makes a point that he, he wants us to know. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, Rather, he made himself nothing. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. That word translated servant could also be translated slave. As I hope I've just established here, he actually takes a form of someone who would be below, beneath a slave. Now, Jesus was not washing his followers' feet in the hopes that we would get into foot washing rituals. Jesus washes his disciples' feet so that we would learn what it means to be humble and what it means to have a servant's heart. This is how we are to, to treat one another. Um, and there's a, a really simple test uh, to measure the extent to which we have a servant's heart. And it's to ask yourself a question. How do you feel when somebody treats you like a servant? I know how I feel. I don't like it. And that reveals something about what's going on in my heart. That I don't have the mind of Jesus when I feel that way. Jesus shows us how to serve by doing something that in his context would have been completely unthinkable. He takes on a role that is 
a rung below a slave. And he washes his disciples' feet. And by the way, John reminds us that he washes all of his disciples' feet. And I want you to think about what that means. On the night of his arrest, Jesus washed the feet of Judas, the one who would betray him. Two. One of the events that we celebrate during uh, Holy Week, and uh, Dick mentioned it to us a, a little earlier in the announcements, we're going to be having a Chosen People Ministry come here and, uh, and actually uh, sort of recreate uh, something of what... Um, celebration of the Passover is like, and we'll be looking at, at Christ in the Passover. But one of the events we celebrate every Holy Week is something called Maundy Thursday. Not Monday Thursday, but Maundy Thursday. Now, where's that word Maundy come from? The word Maundy comes from the Latin word mandatum, that means command or commandment. Uh, novum mandatum, a new commandment. In the upper room, not only does Jesus wash his disciples' feet, but he also gives us clear direction. He offers us a new command. A new command I give you, he says, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And then this, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You know, as I, I read through the scriptures, one of the things that becomes clear to me is I think there must have been a love problem in the early church. And it may well be the case that there has always been a love problem uh, in the church because there's always been a love problem um, because of sin in, in our lives. The Apostle Paul in Roman, or excuse me, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about how we're the body of Christ and each one of us belongs to one another and each of us has gifts that we can contribute to the whole and that we are all so much better together than we are alone, uh, alone and so on. And then after uh, talking about the different gifts that we've been given and how they all work together for the common good, he says, but let me show you a way of life that's the best of all. And he says... If I could speak in the tongues of men and of the angels, but have not love. If we have all these gifts that he's been talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but we don't have love, we're just making a bunch of noise. And then he actually uh, sets out what love looks like and, and what it is. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It does not keep a record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices in the truth. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, endures through, uh, through every circumstance, and so on. It keeps no record of wrongs. It's patient and, and it's kind. Paul spells out what love is. Here in the Gospel of John, the word love is used 44 times in chapters 13 through 21. It's unprecedented kind of compacting of this word love. Five times uh, at least in each chapter, you know, John or Jesus is talking about love. Now, the command to love is not new, but the words Jesus adds to the command to love are. He says, love one another as I have loved you. This is a different kind of love. When most of us think of love, we, you know, we tend to uh, assume that, uh, that love is a feeling that we have for, for other people. There are actually multiple words in the Greek language that, that Jesus could have used, Paul could have used to describe the love that we're supposed to have for, for one another. And both of them choose a very specific term. It's not romantic love. It's not the love that people and families have for one another. This is the kind of love that God has for us. Love one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Of all of the things that Jesus could have mentioned that might um, be a marker or that might indicate whether we truly are following him, Jesus says our love for one another is the key thing. 
You know, a lot of us think uh, being a Christian is about following rules, or being a Christian is about having the proper theological beliefs, or being a Christian is, you know, serving out in the community, and there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But Jesus doesn't highlight those as being the mark of uh, being his disciple. Uh, Those are secondary results of the primary thing. And what's the primary thing? Love. Love one another as I have loved you. This is how we will know that we are really following him. So um, just some questions to ask ourselves. Um, How much? uh, How much do I really love people who are part of my church family? Do I really love them? Sidebar, can I love them if I don't know them? Um, do, do I care about them? Do I pray for them? Am I patient with them? Am I kind to them? Do I encourage them? Do I forgive them? Do I really love them? I, you know, Dick's... Um, has a, a friend, um, I'd love to meet this guy, but not exactly sure who he is. I only know of him because of something that this guy has said, and it's one of the best quotes ever, at least in my judgment. This guy uh, told Dick once, um, I may not be much, but I'm all I think about. <laughs> Isn't that good? <laughs> and you know what? That describes every single one of us. We read a, a passage about love one another, and, and here's, here's where we kind of go. Yeah, people ought to love one another. You know, and why, do, why don't people love me, and why aren't they forgiven towards me? And it's all, you know, suddenly it's a, it's, I'm all I think about. What Jesus is doing here when he says, love one another as I have loved you, is to get us to stop worrying about how other people are treating us and to, and to challenge us to ask the question, no, do I love others? Because I'll tell you something about love. One of the great things about love is if you love others, um, it's amazing how much love you get back. But if you just kind of, you know, stand back and wait for others to come to you, um, wow, not so much. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Uh, this, by the way, Jesus says, um, a, a new command I give you. He doesn't say, I've got another suggestion uh, that I'd like to run by you. He says it's a command, and isn't that odd? He is actually commanding love, and the fact that he's commanding us to love one another uh, reminds us, you you can't command somebody to feel something. That's impossible. So love, obviously, the kind of love that Jesus is talking about, this is a, a decision that we make. It's... um. It's an act of the will rather than just a a feeling that we we happen to have. Love one another as I have loved you. Now, in addition to then showing his disciples how to serve and giving us a crystal clear direction, a new command that we love one another, there is a third thing Jesus also offers his disciples in the upper room. Before uh, I share that with you, I want you to think about a question, an answer to a question here question is this, what do you most worry about? I'm not even going to ask, do you ever worry? I'm asking, what do you most worry about? Now, if I were to actually, you know, go through one by one, we, we could spend the rest of our time together, you know, Scott, what do you most worry about? Some of you are going, I hope he doesn't do that. See, you're already worried. <laughs> we worry about, you know, not being prepared, having to speak in public, all, all these different kind of things. Um, Jesus understands that his disciples are I- experiencing um, sort of this anticipatory anxiety um, because they sense that something's about to happen and it's really big. Because he's, he's addressing this anticipatory grief. They know that they are going to lose Jesus. Jesus has been talking about going to Jerusalem. He's going to, to go there to die. And they see the writing on the wall. And they know what the Sanhedrin's talking about, putting him to death and all of this kind of stuff. And so Jesus, with his disciples in the upper room, and, and the third thing that he does is he offers them 
reassurance. He gives them reassurance. Reassurance in the face of life's biggest challenges and questions. This is what he says. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he shares a number of very specific things he wants us to be sure that we know. He wants his disciples in that room to know, and by extension, he wants us to know as well. And what are some of the things we worry about? You know, we worry about um, health. We worry about people that we love. We worry about our kids. We worry about finances. Uh, we worry about whether uh, other people care about us, if we are appreciated. We, we have a list of all these different things that, that concern us, and it's really amazing that, that Jesus is able to address so many of them um, in in just these few words. Uh, one of the things we worry about is death. I mean, we don't think about it um, maybe a lot unless there is some compelling reason to do so. Um, in this case, Jesus' disciples would have been concerned about it. And the very first reassurance Jesus gives is, look, heaven is for real. My father's house has many rooms, he says. If they, that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? Heaven is for real. You know, um, it, it's been um, the practice of a number of, of people who've been skeptical about religion, want to provide alternatives to uh, the religious faith and so on, to, to say that, uh, that basically heaven is, uh, is nothing more than something we wish were true, but it really isn't. Uh, Freud dis decided that, uh, that heaven was basically... Um, uh, a, a kind of a, a longing, a wish fulfillment. You know, we, we realize we're going to die. We can't live in the face of all this anxiety. And so the, the whole concept of heaven was invented so we could live life without being in despair all the time. Um, Karl Marx uh, famously said that uh, religion was the opiate of the people and uh, that heaven, uh, as it's been said, it's just pie in the sky when you die by and by, a way to placate people so that they could be easily controlled. And so on. this is called reductionism, and it, basically it's the idea that none of this stuff is real. It's, we can just reduce it to economics, or we could reduce it to psychology, or we could reduce it to anxiety and all of this kind of stuff. Jesus uh, provides a very different picture of this. He's not saying, no, this isn't a projection. This isn't something we made up. Heaven is for real. And he says this because he came from heaven. And he says this because he's returning to heaven. He says it with, with authority. Um, many of you know this text uh, with the words, uh, in my father's house there are many, what? Mansions. And you'll notice I didn't say many mansions. I've used a more modern uh, translation. The, word, uh, the translation in my father's house are many mansions actually comes from the 1611 translation of the Bible, uh, the King James version of the Bible. Why don't we say in my house are many mansions today? Because the, the word mansions doesn't mean the same thing as it did in 1611. In 1611, the word mansion just meant a place to live. Nowadays, it means someplace in Beverly Hills where you've got, you know, servants and stuff. Um, very, very different picture. What Jesus is talking about, he's not making a promise that when we go to heaven, we're going to be living in palaces or anything like that. What he's saying is, you know what? God has a place for everybody in his home. There's a place for you there. Heaven is for real. Second, Jesus reassures us that God loves us. You know, how do we know that God loves us? And, and most of us, believe that, um, that God is love. How do we know that? When Philip asked Jesus to show them the Father, um, Jesus says, don't you know me, Philip? Uh, after, uh, even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? How can you say, show us the Father, Jesus says? I've shown you what the Father is like. How do we know what God is really like? The answer is, God has shown us. God has shown us himself. He sent Jesus to show us what he is like. We don't have to invent it. We don't have to make it up. Jesus came to show us, to reveal to us what, what God's like. Karl Barth, um, famous Swiss theologian who uh, taught in, in Germany, um, really amazing uh, theologian, 
of the, the last century, was invited to Princeton Theological Seminary in 1963 to do a series of, of lectures. And uh, during the Q&A, following one of his lectures, one of, his, uh, one of the students there asked, don't you think, Dr. Bart, that God has revealed himself in other religions, not just Christianity? Now, that's a great question, right? Don't you think God has revealed himself in other religions, not just Christianity? This is the way Bart answered, and it's really, really um, a thought-provoking answer. He says, God hasn't revealed himself in any religion, including Christianity. He has revealed himself in Jesus. See, religion is basically a human response to, um, to our experience of God. Um, and, um, and as a result of that, religion uh, it basically comes from us. Jesus came from God. And this is what Bart is getting at here. God has not revealed himself in any religion. He's revealed himself in Jesus. Anyone who knows Jesus knows what God is like, knows how God responds to sin, knows uh, whether or not God really cares, whether God is involved in, um, in, in human life and in our lives. Jesus offers a, a third reassurance, that God hears our prayers one of the most amazing promises in Scripture is found in John uh, chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, where Jesus says this. I remember the first time I read this verse, I had to read it over and over again to make sure I really understood what it was saying because it seemed like such an amazing promise to me. Jesus says, very truly I tell you, this way he, amen, amen, he introduces something he really wants people to pay close attention to. Very truly I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, oftentimes we read that verse and we go, oh, this is so awesome. God will do anything that I ask him to if I just ask in Jesus' name. Um, God, I would love to win the lottery this week, and I'm going to claim that promise in Jesus' name. Is this what he's saying? Totally not. I mean, this is what it means to ask in the name of, of Jesus. Um, here's how I would, um, would describe what, what God's saying here, and it makes the promise no less amazing maybe even more so. When Jesus' followers devote themselves to seeking God's guidance and follow Jesus' example of humble, self-emptying service, ask God the Father for the things that Jesus would ask for and live in loving obedience to God in the power of the Holy Spirit. God hears our prayers. God hears our prayers moves in our lives and works in us and through us as the body of Christ in the world today to do the very things that Jesus did and, he, and as he promises, even more amazing things. I want to repeat that because, you know, there, it, it's very nuanced. When Jesus' followers devote themselves to seeking God's guidance, follow his example of humble, self-emptying service, ask God the Father for the things that Jesus would ask for and live in loving obedience to God in the power of the Holy Spirit, God hears our prayers, moves in our lives, works in us and through us as the body of Christ in the world today. That's an awesome promise. And it is absolutely, I, I believe, I believe every word of it. Jesus' fourth assurance is that we aren't on our own. We're not alone. We are never alone. You know, one of the things I think a lot of people struggle with is just feeling alone in the world. You know, do, do other people uh, love me? Do other people care? Um, God, are, are you real or am I just, you know, do I have to just make this up as, as I go uh, along? We're not alone. Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you 
another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And one of the, uh, reversing, backing up a little bit, uh, one of the gifts that God has, has given us, one of the, the gifts that Jesus has given us so that we won't be alone is one another. This is why he says, love one another as I have loved you. By this, other people will know that you're my followers if you love one another. But it's not just that he's given us one another. He's given us also himself. I will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. This word that's translated advocate is the Greek word uh, parakletos or parakletos, sometimes translated counselor. By the way, the, the fact that it's translated advocate or counselor, I don't know if you're able to pick up. Those are legal terms. We would call that kind of person uh, an attorney. By the way, we would think of them as a defense attorney because they're our advocate. They're on our side. They're standing with us and going through things with us. Sometimes uh, the word's translated comforter or helper. It's a word that describes the Holy Spirit in his role as a personal helping presence who stands with us and is there for us uh, to guide us and, most importantly, to remind us of the truth that Jesus taught. Notice, by the way, when I talked about the Holy Spirit, I didn't say the Holy Spirit it is. I said he is because the Holy Spirit is personal. One of the members of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let me um, say something very briefly about the Holy Spirit and how uh, the Holy Spirit's misunderstood in the church today by a lot of people. A lot of folks in the modern church tend to talk about the Holy Spirit as if the chief mark of the presence of the Holy Spirit is how we feel. Um, I, I have heard um, you know, folks say things like, well, I was in worship and I really felt like the Holy Spirit was present. Um, and oftentimes, uh, people will describe this as a, you know, as a, a feeling power. And, I, and I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit isn't powerful and doesn't do powerful things. Here's the problem with that. When we identify the presence of the Holy Spirit with uh, some, uh, some feeling of power, what we may imagine is that if we don't feel something, that the Holy Spirit isn't there. You know how Jesus describes the Holy Spirit? He says that the Holy Spirit will remind us of the things that he taught. It doesn't say that he'll make us feel some way. He'll remind us of Jesus' truth. Uh, yesterday evening, somebody heard this message. And they came, uh, they actually, they sent me a, a message um, after the uh, worship service and said, you know, there was a period of time not long ago when I really drifted away from God. And one of the things that um, God kept doing uh, when I was doing stuff that I knew really wasn't um, pleasing to him is he just keep reminding me of what the Bible said. And it was, it, it was a very, very powerful experience for this guy. And if, it, not that he, you know, he felt, wow, I'm standing in the presence of God, but just this, this constant reminder of, hey, I'm real. And I have something to say that uh, is directly related to your life. I believe that's the work of the Holy Spirit among us. Um, there's a big mistake if we, we identify too much the work of the Holy Spirit as generating some kind of feeling, because this is what will happen. If we don't happen to feel something, we'll think that the Holy Spirit isn't present, and we'll go someplace else to find the feeling That's not how it works. We, we are, are no longer seeking God. What we're seeking in that po po point is we're looking for a feeling, not God. And here's how God works in our lives. When you sit in worship and you feel like, wow, um, that speaks directly to where I am in my life. I needed to hear that today. You know, that's not a big, ooh, wow, God's in the house. You know what it is? 
It's no, God is in the house. Very quietly working in our hearts, drawing us closer to himself. Jesus says, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. One of the things I've never, uh, you know, I, as I was doing research for this message, I, I was just, you know, kind of reviewing scripture. And I couldn't find a single passage where Jesus says to his disciples, wow, wasn't that a powerful experience? You know, what he says is stuff like, let not your hearts be troubled. And he speaks these words of truth and these parables, and they just start working on us and drawing us toward God. And it's very quiet, and it's very, but that, that's what brings lifelong change. One-fifth assurance is that in the end, we have nothing to fear. Well, let me go back to the earlier question I asked where um, it's trying to tease out what are the things that we worry about. And we worry about our kids and we worry about our relationships and we worry about money and we worry about health and we worry about death and all this. And if you take all of those things, uh, basically it comes down to one of two fears. They all grow out of one of two fears. The fear of the consequences of sin, the fear of the consequences of death, which are really all related to sin. Jesus says, we have nothing to fear because he's going to die on the cross to take care of the sin problem by dying in our place. And he's going to be raised on the third day after his crucifixion to let us know that he's taking care of the death problem too. And so he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. You know, sometimes people tell us, hey, don't worry. Don't worry about it. It's, it's all good. Jesus isn't saying it's all good. This is not a glib promise that's meant to kind of shut us up and paper over, you know, our anxiety and stuff. This is not a glib promise. This is a guarantee grounded in the character and in the nature and in the divine plan and purpose and will of God. Jesus is about to be glorified through his death on the cross and vindicated as Messiah and Son of God through his resurrection from the dead, making it possible for us to enjoy true peace with God, the kind of peace that he has with the Father, a peace that is not as the world gives, which is no peace because it vanishes and it's based on vanity, but his peace in which we have nothing really to fear. Now then, with hours, if not minutes to spare, before he is turned over to those who will put him to death, John tells us that Jesus does one more thing, one last thing. Jesus prays. John chapter 17 is Jesus' prayer. And there is an important feature of this prayer that I want to call your attention to. You will not understand this prayer if you don't understand this piece, and it's this. Jesus was thinking about you and praying for you when he went to the cross. Jesus was thinking about you and praying for you when he went to the cross. This prayer is sometimes called the high priestly prayer. It has also been called the real Lord's Prayer, uh, and it's called the real Lord's Prayer because what we call the Lord's Prayer is actually a prayer that Jesus gave to the, his disciples in response to a question, teach us how to pray. And Jesus says, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And he, and he gives us a model prayer that we can follow. That's our prayer. It's not really the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is John chapter 17 where Jesus himself prays and John overhears it. What does Jesus pray about in Jesus' own personal prayer, he's praying for you and for me. Listen to this. My prayer, he says, is not for them. And when he says that, he's referring to his disciples. He says, my prayer is not for them alone, but I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Do you know who that is? Us. I'm praying for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus went to the cross thinking about and praying 
for you and for me. He went to the cross praying that your faith would be built and established and based on the firsthand eyewitness testimony and accounts of his disciples. He went to the cross praying for our unity, that we would be one. He went to the cross praying that our witness, our witness would be added to the witness of those who came before us and to the witness of those who will follow after us that the world might believe because God so loved the world. Most important thing I think that we need to know as we look at this passage of Scripture today is that as uh, we will, next week is, is Palm Sunday, and we're going to be hearing about the passion of Jesus, his uh, arrest, his betrayal, his arrest, uh, his trials, uh, his scourging, and his uh, crucifixion. That before Jesus did any of that, he prayed for us because he did that for us because God so loves the world. How do we respond to that kind of love? With gratitude, with faith, and by loving one another as he loved us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together.